Jesus called his disciples, and that would be you and me, to serve one another. They struggled with it, as we all do, but it was a command of our Lord. As Christ followers, we are called to love one another as he loved us. And that love is to be fleshed out in serving one another. Service is the hands and feet of real love. Now, this is going to take an attitude adjustment for most of us, which can only come from a Romans 12 type of mind renewal. Jesus worked on this principle for most of his life, most of the three years that he had his disciples. One such teaching time came in Mark chapter 9 where Jesus tried to contrast the way the world thinks with how he thinks. Let's listen in. Mark 9, 33 through 37. They came to Capernaum where he was in the house. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, (laughs) they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now, I don't know why, but, but this episode from Mark has always produced a, a really vivid picture in my mind. And perhaps it's because I can, I can picture myself being in that disciple's argument about who was the most important, who was the best. Perhaps it's because I can... I can feel the shame of of trying to hide from Jesus what I'm talking about or thinking about. And that doesn't work. Have you ever argued about who was the greatest? Have you? Uh, I'm not talking about those open arguments that occur with other people in the church lobby or out in the parking lot. I'm talking about those arguments that go on in your heart between you and God. And they happen when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something that you don't want to do. That you may think, well, that's beneath me. You know, like when when God asks you to serve in the nursery and you say, I've changed my share of diapers, thank you. Or when God asks you to teach children's church and you say, I did that years ago. It's somebody else's turn. We still argue with God about who is the greatest because any time he calls us to do something and we decline, we are actually asserting that we are greater than God. Are you hearing me? We are telling God, I'll be your servant, but only when it suits me. And that is why John 13 is one of the most neglected scriptures in the New Testament today. Listen to what Jesus did on his final approach, the last night of his life here on earth. John 13, 1 through 17, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so... He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wrapped around him. He he came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, 
you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon replied, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Let's stop here just a minute. You realize that Jesus washed Judas' feet that night? Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do what I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Mark 9 and John 13 show that Christ values genuine servanthood among his disciples. These verses proclaim that servanthood begins in the heart. Some of you are well down the road on this. You've been serving God faithfully for years. For others today, this may be just a starting point. And that's okay because that's the kind of church this is. God just wants us to start from where we are and grow. And there are at least five steps to genuine servanthood, and I want us to take a look at them today because if we don't get through these, we're probably not going to make it as a genuine servant. Number one, humility. <laughs> this is a must-have. I'm not talking about self-depreciation. That's not it. That's not humility. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, we have the disciples. That's you and me. We're in Mark 9. They kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. That's us. On the other hand, we have Jesus, John 13, 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he was wrapped around him. Early church theologian St. Augustine was once heard to say, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men like the angels. When I was farming, uh, we used to gather at the farming watering hole down in Talmadge, Kansas, and sit around and tell lies and smoke. Now, that's what farmers do when it's raining and you have some time off. And I remember asking this one really old farmer there, he'd been in the game for a long time, and he was successful by, by our standards. What would you attribute your success as a farmer to? Kind of with a twinkle in his eye, he said, well, it's about 50% weather, 50% good luck, and the rest is brains. I don't know if you do math, but that doesn't leave much for brains, you know. He meant what he said. That's humility. Humility means having the right attitude about self, and it also means having the right attitude about the master. Humility causes us not to be uptight about our position, which is, by the way, always lower than someone else. I mean, always there's somebody always above us that's normal it, it, it is it's this all men are created equal culture that we're in that fights so much against that that this is a difficult concept to swallow two quotations come to mind here John Brody a, a, a most valuable player quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers from way back yesterday was I remember him being asked one time why a multi-million dollar player like him should have to hold the ball for field goals and points after touchdown. 
Well, said Brody, if I didn't, it would fall over. <laughs> That's humility. An admirer once asked the famous orchestra conductor Leonard Bernstein, what was the most difficult instrument to play in the orchestra? He responded quickly, second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who plays second violin with as much enthusiasm or second French horn or second flute, now that's a problem. And yet, if no one plays second, we have no harmony. Holding the ball and second fiddle. Without someone willing to do one of those, no points are scored. Without someone willing to do the other, no harmony is produced. True servanthood is impossible without humility. The older we get in the faith, the better we should understand humility. It was the great preacher F.B. Meyer who once said, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves like one above the other, and the taller we could grow in Christian character, the easier we could reach them. And he said, I, I now know that God's gifts are on shelves one beneath the other. And it's not a question of growing taller, but of stooping lower. That we have to go down, always down, to get his best gifts. That's humility. What does it take to be a true servant? Humility. How do we de develop humility? By serving, even if we don't want to. In this day of gifts tests and interest surveys, it's not unusual to hear someone say, well, oh, that's not my gift. And I'm telling you, this can be disconcerting for pastors since I've just asked them to help with hamburgers at the car show. That's not my gift. How much talent does that take? Crossroads is a great church. And that's because we have a group of people here who over the years have chosen to serve and sacrifice. But in this age of filled up date books and every night activities, this concept, it's in big danger. My plea is this, in humility, write Jesus and the church into your schedule in permanent ink. You may get tired, but you'll never be sorry you did. The second plank here, submission. Boy, that's a dirty word today. Sometimes we have to serve in order to submit. Mark 9 again, sitting down Jesus called the twelve and said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and servant of all. And then sometimes we have to submit in order to serve, to be served. John 13, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. One of the interesting things I've learned recently uh, boy, YouTube's a great place to learn new things, you know. It's also a good place to screw your life up, but it's, it's also a good place to learn things. I recently learned that about, some, about flight in outer space, and I, I never knew this, that, that you must, and when you're in outer space, you must slow down to catch up. What? If two satellites or spacecrafts desire to, to rendezvous, the one that is making the approach does not accelerate. It must decelerate. And if it increases its speed, the craft just goes into a higher orbit. But if it decreases its speed, it drops into a, a lower orbit and, and actually gains on the craft ahead of it. Now, I don't know how to explain that, but that's what it said. Most rendezvous in space are designed so that the approaching craft comes in from a higher orbit and slows down in order to catch up. Now, one of the things that some of you have learned during this COVID, whatever it's been called, you had to slow down. Some of you 
flourished in that. Some of you benefit, some of you it drove you crazy. And we do. I mean, I'm, not, I'm serious about this. We have a lot of mental health issues going on now because of isolation. We're really made to be around people. But in a sense, this slowing down is how we best get in line with God's will for our life. If we constantly struggle emotionally and spiritually to please God, if we, if we speed up our activity, we only make it hard on ourselves. And it will probably move us further from God's perfect will rather than closer. It's, the best way to serve God is to slow down and submit our lives to His control. Submit. And the more we yield ourselves to God's timing and God's plan, the more energy we have to use for His service. It's a case of if you give in, you won't give out. If you slow down, you will gain. Submission is almost a dirty word in the church today. Oh, oh we're willing to submit as, as long as we can do what we want. You hear a lot of talk these days about shared leadership and team building. And, and that is all well and good, but at some point, someone has to make a decision. And as the old Native American proverb says, if two people ride on a horse, one must ride behind. Duh. Or how about this proverb from the real world workplace? Before you have an argument with your boss, Take a look at both sides, his side and the outside. Yeah. God is boss. Jesus is Lord. We submit to his will. Are you in submission to God? Are you? Are you in submission to anyone in your life? I've always been interested in World War II stuff. I, now, look, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be, but I'm fascinated with the effort it took to win that war. I had two uncles in that war. My dad grew up during that time and my mom, so I heard a lot of stories. But I'm, I'm just fascinated by how this nation worked together. PBS put out a, a Ken Burns documentary on this that I'm telling you, it should be required in every American history class there is. It's called The War. Ken Burns. Look it up. Watch it. And since I watched that documentary, I've processed a bit on how much it took from not only the Allies, but from everyone here inside the country to win that war. A lot of people from all over, took a lot of orders during that time. A lot of people sacrificed their time to make it work, their lives to make it work on the home front and in the front lines. That's a lot of submission that was going on, a lot of submission. And as I have watched our nation in the last 10 years, I am convinced that it would be nearly impossible for today's USA to ever do something like that again. I'm not confident at all that we would be able to win a war like that again. Why? Because we do not submit to authority like that anymore. We do not have a sufficient number of people who would be willing to sacrifice that much. We question everything. And if we don't get what we want, we're out of there. And worse yet, we're in the streets burning down buildings and destroying businesses. We become a spoiled nation. We are the boss now. And we're showing it. We will decide for ourselves what is right and good, what is good and bad. We don't take orders. We don't obey commandments. That's oppressive. That's archaic. That's old-fashioned. Now, some of you may see that as good, but I'm not so sure that it is. For those who will not submit to law and authority will likely not ever submit to God until they're flat on their face, and that can be pretty ugly. 
And I'm not so sure which comes first, but they are related. How can I get better at submission and in so doing being a servant? Two thoughts from a couple of spiritual giants might help us this morning about submission. Amy Carmichael, a Christian missionary who served for 55 years without a furlough and wrote many books. She also wrote these words down. Holy Spirit, think through me until your ideas are my ideas. Holy Spirit, think through me till your ideas are my ideas. And then there was Jim Elliott, another Christian missionary who was one of the five killed in their attempt to evangelize people of Ecuador, some natives down there, and they were all murdered. He said once, one does not surrender a life in an instant. That which is lifelong can only be surrendered in a lifetime. That's submission. That might even be called one day at a time. Pray for that to become a trait in your life. Work at it, practice it, do it. A third step in genuine servanthood, gratitude. Gratitude is a wholehearted and a rich sense of thankfulness. Not always for the stuff we have, because we can always find fault with that, but for what we've been given in this life. We catch a glimpse of it in Colossians 2, 6 through 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and listen to this, and overflowing with thankfulness. Overflowing with thankfulness. One of the fir first sermons I ever preached, uh, I preached at the little Talmadge Church. And this was my theme that night. It was a Thanksgiving service between two or three churches. And I talked about overflowing with thankfulness. And, and, and we, we, we said that night that, you know, there are a couple ways you can overflow. Uh, you can get filled up so full that it just runs over the side. Now, that's what most of us think of as overflowing with thankfulness. But another way we overflow is when we got stuff in our cup and it gets bumped. Uh, our floor shows that you've overflowed with thankfulness a lot in this room. Life bumps us. What comes out of your cup when life does this to you? Is it thankfulness or is it bitter? Because it's going to happen. In this world, you will have trouble. There is no getting around that. True gratitude brings with it a motivation to service because it's deeply devoted to the master. I mean, how can you ever repay someone who has rescued you and saved your life, not only here on earth, but for eternity? How can you ever pay that back? You cannot. The grateful heart begins to say, along with David in Psalm 116, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. This sounds like depression to me. And then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteousness. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted. And when I was in great need, he saved me. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst of Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. You think this guy's thankful? I think so. He heard my cry for mercy. 
How many could raise your hand on that? I was overcome, but he saved me. I'm now your servant. The only way this could ever change is if somehow we blank out, we forget how much he's done for us. Don't forget. Work at remembering. It's not easy, but do the work. Number four, faithfulness. Faithfulness doesn't have so much to do with what we do to serve God and others. It has to do with what kind of servant I'm going to be. Mark 9, 37. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Jesus was about giving glory to his Father here. He, he's saying, if you serve me, you're serving God. God wants wholehearted servants. He wants faithfulness from his bride the church. He doesn't want unfaithful bride. He wants a faithful bride. Faithfulness in short supply today, man. Faithfulness is, is being true not only to the Lord, but to others as well. It involves having the right motives and the right priorities. It involves being a trustworthy servant, taking care of God's property, even if it seems uh, his blessings seem slow in coming. If he seems slow in coming back, and by the way, in case you didn't know it, everything belongs to God. We just borrowed as we walk through this life, as the short life, as, as we heard this morning already. It involves perseverance, serving the Lord even when the going gets tough. And when it doesn't seem to benefit as, us as much as that TV preacher told us it would. It involves having integrity even when we think nobody's watching. When people have faithful hearts, their outlook is long-term. When people are faithless, their outlook is very short-term. Faithful people take vows very seriously. Faithless people treat vows as a daily option, maybe even an hourly option. And if that is true, then it would be my contention that we live in a fairly faithless society. It, it's probably time to get faithfulness to the emergency room, but my fear is it may well be DOA on arrival. Relationship not going the way you want, get out. Being a parent too demanding, move out. School too tough, drop out. Life's pressures too much, check out. The church too morally demanding, skip out. God's way too narrow-minded, bail out. Need to escape your responsibilities, space out. Faithfulness is in short supply, but it is still a necessary ingredient for genuine servanthood. Are you a faithful person? Are you a faithful servant? One more step, genuine servanthood. Practice. Practice. To be a genuine servant, you have to actually serve. <laughs> Duh. You actually have to do it. To be a genuine servant, you can't just give it lip service. Well, we talked about servanthood at my church. Mark 9, 37, whoever welcomes one of these little children into my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. And John 13, 14 through 17, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You would be blessed if you do what? Do them. You have to practice servanthood. Servanthood is an attitude, but it's also an action. You have to do service to be a servant. 
in, in our culture today, the opportunities are numerous. They're all over the place, inside and outside of the church. There's a lot of opportunities here, but there's a lot of opportunities in the Salina community to serve people. But it's going to take time and energy and sacrifice. And, and you'll have to give up something in order to serve God. There's no way around that. You cannot serve without giving up something. And it's going to make you tired at times. But as you often hear people say today, it's a good tired. Acts 26, 16 does a good job of summing up this action or practice end of servanthood. Here's what it says. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. Get up. Get out and get going. Serve the Lord in some way. Serve your brothers and sisters in some way. Serve the children in some way. Serve those who can't help themselves in some way. And yes, there are people like that out there. Check your humility level. Be willing to submit. Is there real gratitude in your heart toward God? Do you need an increase in your faithfulness level? Are you still holding a grudge of some kind? Are you ready to practice servanthood? God can only use us to the extent that we permit him to change us. Our decision can be immediate, but it will also need to be regularly renewed. So you, you could make a decision today to do it, but tomorrow you've got to wake up and say, am I going to be a servant today? Am I going to be a servant the next day? Am I going to be a servant? Jesus calls his church to servanthood. Will you respond? Will you say yes? Jesus gave his all for us. Will you give your all for him? Let's stand for prayer. Lord, I don't know how this message comes across in today's culture. I don't know how people's hearts receive it, but I know this. Every word of it's truth. And this is who we are called to be. I pray that Crossroads Church could be a light in this community because we are populated by people who serve you in some way. Help us to kneel at your feet, Lord, and do what you've called us to do. Help us to find out what our gift is, do what we do best, but help us always be ready to stoop and serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, you cannot do this until you know Jesus personally, until you have the Spirit of God living in you. This will, this will wear you out. But once the Spirit of God lives in you, once you have cried out, God, save me, and he saves you, then something happens, and you can serve him. Do you need to be saved today? Do you need to come to Jesus today? If so, I'm just going to ask you to step out and come here. It's your first step of obedience. If you come, we'll just pray over you. We don't do anything goofy like knocking people down. But we just, we're asking, is this your day? Is this it? Is this the day that you need to touch base?